Okay, this is the Breach Combat Manual. <coughs> and uh, our, our moderator is uh, also one of the co chairs, Bo Holland. Uh, Bo is uh, founder and CEO of All Clear ID. Uh, we've got a great panel, so uh, before you have some of the absolute most experienced uh, experts in breach response, we're all on the side of uh, the customer facing aspect of a response. So we're sort of the emergency room. Um, when it gets bad, you know, you never want to get to us, but when you do need it, uh, it's really valuable to have a team that you can count on that knows how to execute a response and get you safely to the other side. You know, if there's a lot of uh, bad news that you've heard about all day, uh, you'll hear more from us, um, difficulties and challenges. Uh, the good news is if you do get to this point where you do have to have a customer facing response, notify, uh, answer thousands and thousands of questions and, uh, and protect people from fraud. Uh, that if you do a good job at it, you can succeed and you can get through these things quickly. So this is really where the, the rubber meets the road in terms of what companies are really concerned about, which is how do we keep our customers as customers? How do we survive a, an event that is potentially um, you know, disruptive uh, to the relationship that you've invested so much to, uh, to put in place? Uh, after all, in most businesses, the customers pay the bills. And so if you don't do a good job in handling this kind of event, you really can set yourself up for some pain. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, you know, we've demonstrated that if you do a good job on the response, you can literally say, you know, two to three times uh, the amount of money your total bill can be uh, dramatically different if you do a good job on the front end on the response. Um, so this includes the third party cost, how many lawsuits you get, how many regulated penalties you get. All of these things that add up to the total cost. You know, a lot of times we end up talking about, you know, how much does it cost to mail a letter and Know, call center hours and these little things, but the big costs are, you know, the costs that come from lost sales, lost customer relationships, brand damage, um, and the third party uh, problems that show up. So that's really what we want to focus on. So we've got a great panel, but I'm going to ask you folks to do first. Let's go down the road and just orient you to what each of us does so you understand our role in the ecosystem um, and a little bit about the contribution that we make to the response effort. So Ozzy, will you start us off? Sure thing. So I'm Ozzy Fonseca, I'm a Senior Director for the Data Breach Resolution Team at Experian. Uh, my team and I have worked on a little bit more than 13,000 uh, data breaches, and we've sent uh, notification letters to the victims, set up call centers to answer questions about the event, and provided uh, fraud detection and fraud resolution services to, to the victims so that they can go back to, to their normal lives. I'm Bill Hardin with Navigant. Uh, our firm has worked on north of 350 breaches in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, we're the first responders. We're the people that are, we I call ourselves the Marines. We get in, we get out, figure out what's going on, help you get back to business. So. I'm Larissa Crum. I'm Executive Vice President for Immersion. We've worked uh, since 2008 on a little over 500 data breaches. We focus on the address scrubbing, the print and mail, call center, and the return mail process. I'm, I'm John Knightson. I'm what you heard today described as a breach coach. I think it's important to remember, that for those of you who don't, that Mark Greisiger invented that word, that term breach coach. So there's a scary thought. Mark Greisiger invented what I am. Um, but, but in reality, in reality I, I, I focus on helping uh, companies manage, uh, protect their information and maximize its value more. And I've gotten to come to these over the years. I'll be taking sort of a contrarian stance today just because it's the last session before drinks. I don't think people are surprised. My name is Melanie Thomas. I have a public relations, crisis communications, and crisis preparedness firm called Inform. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., and uh, we have associates around the country. Um, our specialty is we've each been in the PR world for over 25 years. We're all former journalists and been doing crisis communications for probably 20 of those years, so that tells you how good I was in the news business very short career, uh, but I'm much happier in this space, and um, that's what we do. Well, thank you. So we all have a playbook. We, you heard the different roles. It really begins with the, uh, the breach coach. That's the center uh, position. That's the quarterback in this game. Um, uh, Bill comes in next as the forensics figure out what happened. Was there any damage? Do we have to notify what records were affected? Um, and then myself, Ozzy, and Larissa, we come in on 
um, do we need to notify? And then over this entire thing, you've got the public relations aspect communicating through the press, um, responding to regulators um, that goes through the entire process. So these are the different roles. We all have a playbook. We all know exactly how this is supposed to go. And yet, it never goes that way. Um, every event seems to be a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to kick off one of the things that we bump into that's uh, interesting is the corporate cultures. Um, we often meet a company. We may never have worked together. Um, we meet them. It's a, uh, a Las Vegas wedding, if you will. And uh, we're, we're just getting past the names, and now we're dealing with an incredibly uh, sensitive issue, um, their reputation, their customers, and all of this. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what are the cultural things that come into play? What are the executive personality issues that come into play um, that change the game, uh, that require this team to react, respond, and still figure out how to get across the line? So John, will you start us off since you're at the beginning of this? OK, so I'm at the beginning, but as I say, I'm not just a breach coach. I, so my clients are really smart, and the, I've got an important message in response to what I've been hearing today, which is that if you've been hearing about clients who are or, uh, insureds who don't know what they're doing today. And uh, imagine, if you will, uh, the difference between them and, and a, a client and insured that knows that uh, this is a critical but regular moment in their customer relationship when, they're, when there's a breach. It's happening to them all the time. It's something they have to be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So those are really smart clients that don't need a lot of the things that you've heard today. So the dangerous thing would be somebody who listens to what they hear at a seminar like this and then just does it. So for example, what you heard today is um, you never uh, notify or let your let your uh, your the the, the uh, individuals know before you you've done the forensics. You understand the extent of the breach. If there's time, we'll provide you with plenty of evidence of cases where that's wrong. You don't want to believe that. You don't want to proceed into this thing as if there is a playbook. You have to be really smart. You have to know that you care more as a as an insured about your customers than the than this breach team ever will care about it. But this is a critical issue in your customer relationship, and you know how to manage that. And so you deal with that effectively using the tools that are provided to you by the insurer, but not believing what the insurer says, because to the insurer, you're just another insured. To, if, if all of you know corporate cultures where the, it's, a, it's an encompassing and, and very effective culture, and, and, and so those are the ones where they're able to act fast and responsibly so the kinds of things we're going to talk about today, like the collapse of the timeline with the Krebs uh, in intrusions, um, you know, that, that uh, make uh, a, a response effective. We work with a lot of smart clients, but I wouldn't say that all of our clients are smart on the data breach side. I mean, I think one of the things to talk about corporate culture is two things that kind of raise the hair on the back of my neck when I have an initial call with the client. And the first is, okay, you always ask them, who is telling you you need to notify? And as soon as they tell me general counsel, that raises a red flag and, and raises the hair on the back of my neck. The second question that I follow up with is, do you know if the general counsel has consulted a privacy attorney? And with their reply, what is that? Then that's the second red flag. So those, from a corporate culture perspective, I think they don't know what they don't know. You know, when we talk about the fact that the, the breach coach or the attorney should be the quarterback, we firmly, firmly believe that. We've had four particular incidents in the last 24 months where we have been the first call, and after counsel got involved at our request or our insistence, all four incidents resulted in zero duty to notify. And one of those was in excess of two million notices. Now, stunk for us because we didn't get the we didn't get the business, but it, getting the right people involved initially is very, very important. And I find that in the in the corporate culture of things, again, they don't know what they don't know. So, so John, are you seeing more through the years that the C-suite's getting heavily involved? Like, who do you who's now the person you're talking to the most? So, what with the really smart clients, which I'm going to talk about because they're different than the ones you're hearing about other ones. Um, what, what you do is you manage the process down. So I've got one client that's had 480 breaches this year. 
And so one in every 10, I'm getting involved in those. And yes, the, the, the general counsel and the CEO are involved in this thing because they know this is a critical part of their day-to-day -day customer relationships. But the fact of the matter is that we have it managed to the point where you don't, you, you, you escalate to the breach coach-like person when you need to, but, but the fact is that it's a regular intake, it's a managed process. And, and, and that's what I see in the really effective ones. And those are the ones that really save the money. So, like that, to, so that's the smart client, but what about the other client? I'd like to speak to the other client, if I could. Um, from a PR perspective, it, it's been very interesting to watch in public responses how the C-suite will come out oftentimes unprepared. They've not been media trained. The messages have not been vetted. Um, oftentimes, the process is handled by corporate communications, and this is a group that, while very good at their job, they know a little bit about a lot of subjects, but they don't know anything about breach. They don't know anything about regulatory requirements. Um, very often, they want to run the response where, you know, from my perspective, I take the lead from the privacy attorney, and I work with the privacy attorney as well as the in-house counsel and corporate communications, HR, forensics, IT, to really create the appropriate response to be delivered at the appropriate time. And the difficult thing for communications people is they have a hard time sitting on their hands and getting them to trust us to let the process play out so we know the extent of the damage and what the appropriate response will be I won't call any of my clients smart or dumb. I think that they're all very good at what they do. I think that this is an area where we've experienced extremely high profile and damaging breaches, and I don't need to name any of them because you all know who they are. Uh, but they have resulted in the loss of the C-suite. They have resulted in class action lawsuits that are too numerous to count. Um, and what I'm now seeing, and what's exciting to me, is a change in the corporate culture. I'm having companies contact me and ask for preparedness training, which is an area that, you know, I think we all should really encourage. No one does well in a crisis scenario, but they'll do better if they have an adequate plan that's built with, to use Mark's term, the Tiger team. And everyone is rehearsed. <laughs> The C-suite is media trained and they're ready to go. And then they, you know, at that point, once they've worked with us, that they have our trust and, and they know that when they place a call to us, we're going to handle this and, and hold their hand through the process. So that's a very exciting development. You mentioned something there about um, these companies are good at what they do. And one of the cultural phenomena that we see time and time again is the habits, the muscle memory that companies have developed that make them good operators in their daily life um, work against them when they find themselves in an emergency. So, you know, planning, being uh, deep analysis, being very careful, make sure you're very comprehensive, um, don't waste any money. Um, these things that are built into most companies uh, on a normal day that are healthy for them, when you get into an emergency response situation, you simply don't have the time. And so this is a culture shift in this moment where they're working with us. It's um, fast response. Yeah. That's the difference that I would stress, rather than emergency response. It's not an emergency. It's a day-to-day -day occurrence. So, Bill, I know you end up in some really tricky situations. <laughs> yeah, it's, um... Well, you two guys are going at it right now. Uh, should I call Don King in and <laughs> get some stuff done? Um, it's, uh... It's an emergency situation. Uh, people act irrationally, especially when you have C-suite members, sales are going down, the public relations are going up, and they're firing off emails at 3 a.m. in the morning going, hey, what about this, what about that? And they're, they're not thinking about what they're doing. And a lot of times when we get involved, in some of our team members will work 48, 72 hours straight, and we work in shifts, because you've got to figure out exactly who, what, when, how, especially if you have an ongoing attack that's within the system. Uh, I just had a client recently that the hacker took over their Twitter account and was taunting them. <laughs> Basically, you can't shut me out. Okay, fine. Uh, through that, uh, they changed all the username and passwords. They went through their particular plan, 
he got on their message board and he goes, it's this the best you can do to change your username and passwords. It's changing. The, the dynamics are changing. And what, what do I mean by that? So I'm going to use a term of art that I would like for everyone to take out of this room. It's called offense preference. Now, what does that mean? Somebody throw a, a lot of people from Philadelphia here by chance. All right, who's your team? New York Giants, bad example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go with the Eagles. <laughs> and with the Eagles, uh, Chip Kelly is the coach of the Eagles. He used to coach at Oregon. <laughs> there we go. But the thing is, no matter what the defense did, no matter what they prepped for, the offense would normally score. They would figure out a way. So you've got to change the mindset of throwing all this technology at it and these plans and everything else because the people that are running these sophisticated attacks, they've only got to be successful once getting in your door. So if you take um, like a hockey team, again, you're the goalie. Everyone here is the goalie. You've got to keep the bad guys out. It only takes one goal. So now that you're in the system, now what's going to happen? How do you look at the attack patterns that are going to be there? And that's how you have to start thinking about this, especially from a breach response perspective. The ghost is still in there. How do you make sure that they're out and they're staying out? It's a very challenging task. And especially from a PR perspective, when you have a initial breach, and then you think you have containment, and you come out and say you have containment, and then you have a second breach, then what? And what kind of happens from a public relations standpoint? What will yeah, it's about good security. There's no doubt about that. But then the question is, um, you know, is are all cases like the ones that he's describing? Consider this. We're, the whole day today, we've been talking about breaches as if a breach is one thing. The, res the proper response to a credit card breach or an email breach can be completely different from the proper response to a social security breach. The legislature of this fair state just figured that out in the, in the bill that they just passed. They understand that you know, credit monitoring works for social security numbers and driver's license numbers, and for, for credit card breaches, other things work. In fact, what you could do, just think about this, instead of getting these people to work 48, 72 hours, what if you just said, the moment that you see that cards may be compromised, we'll help to arrange for or give you all new cards. How much would that cost? Not so much. There are ways to do these things. That, that, um, that the, the big companies that are smart companies but deal, do breach response very badly don't think of. So those what, are the John, But John, let, let's, let's run with that scenario. Okay, so you are a retailer. Your POS system has now been infiltrated. You don't know what's going on. How do you process cards for the general public in order for them to say, I have comfort that my data is now going to be protected. Let's say Let me give you an example. Here's uh, Jewel Osco in Chicago, where I'm from. Go Bears, even though they got a terrible record this year. Maybe they need some offensive preference training. Um, there's people standing out front of Jewel Osco going, I'm just using cash going forward because I don't trust you guys with my stuff. And it, and it starts resonating with them. So how do you, here's how, okay. Well, the, the way you do it is, for example, let's say you're not as big as Target. So, so, you know, so Target, you know, has this giant breach in its POS system. How easy would it, would it have been for them to outsource their POS from that moment? Um, not so easy for a Target, but really easy for some of the clients that I've had. So that's what they've done, right? If you, get, if you find that there's a hack that gets into your POS system and you're unlike my clients, you don't have network segmentation, that, that knocks off the HVAC vendor, you know, um, from your from your from your uh, customer system. Then what you do is you. That's the moment where you say, okay, we're going to outsource. We're going to make a new arrangement. We're going to protect you from this moment forward because we actually care about you, and we're going to get to you before Brian Krebs does. Well, hold and, on, and, I, I have one, one, a couple points to make. Um, I, I great debate, by the way. Good stuff. I think, I think I'm going to call them. Um, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Trying to give you something before the end of the day. I appreciate it. I've got to tell you, I don't agree with all the statements being made because there are a couple of very important realities that are not being addressed. Uh, we're talking about technology, about all sorts of certain things, about um, addressing the breach as though it is a very clean sort of a medical procedure, and that's not really how it works. The reality is there's a very high emotional um, amount of activity going on, and there's also a lot of going back very briefly to what Bo started with, which was culture. 
and give a couple of numbers that are going to make you think about breaches a little bit differently. Only about in 50% of organizations do the boards or the CEOs, uh, are, they're involved in any way, shape, or form with data breach plan. And only in 36% of companies do the, the, either the boards or the CEO want to be informed about a material data breach. They just don't want to know. Period. So, if, first of all, you know, there has to be a culture where having a breach and detecting it and reporting it matters. Did you know that whenever there's a breach, there was a study a couple of years ago from Pongyuan, in about 78% of breaches were the fault of some employee, different reasons why. But only in 19% of the cases were breaches reported by employees because they were scared, they don't want to lose their job. I mean, how many of you here would actually say, you know what, I sent an email with all the information to someone I didn't really mean to? No one would do that. You know what, you catch me and then you can fire me. I'm going to tell you first. So that's the reality. So there's a high degree of emotion, there's a high degree of cultural items that need to be addressed before we jump into, hey, let's have the POS system go over here, let's do, you know, even the forensics. Before I call you, I have to say, look, I'm the IT guy, I totally messed this thing up. Do I want to go outside first? So Absolutely. you have to address all those things before we get into the cleanup process. Right, I agree with that. And I think I just want to add, getting back to culture, there is a, um, a lack of understanding within a lot of companies of what is privacy? What is the responsibility of every employee in that company? And I think this gets back to preparedness. Um, for me, that's become sort of the buzzword. Yes, employees are afraid to report that they may have been responsible for a major violation of privacy. I, I probably would as well. I suspect most of us would. So I think that it begins with a greater awareness internally with, with the people within the company about what their responsibilities are, where the vulnerabilities exist. And I think once you come into a company and you begin the training process with them and you become a part of their team, I think you start to shift that culture. Everyone develops a sense of a stake in the process. Um, and, you know, vulnerabilities in your systems, whether you're talking about your networks or you're talking about your, your human response will become glaringly obvious. And then you can help your clients start to address those. At the time of the crisis is the worst possible time to have, say, the head of your IT department meet the head of HR. Who maybe he met seven years ago during his interview process. They've had no exposure to one another. Quite frankly, everyone's feeling scared vulnerable. They all think their jobs are on the line, that the company they work for is going to go down in flames. So the posture becomes very defensive. It's not cooperative. And I think that we need to really start messaging back into our clients that this is a process that every company in America, every organization, every municipality needs to inform themselves, their employees, their clients, their customers, and the marketplace. And that's what we've been doing since 2005, right? And so, so I, I, would, I don't disagree with anything she's saying or anything that anybody else is saying, but there are two ends of the spectrum, right? So there are the ones where, where a breach is still a big stigma, and that's where the employees are scared to report that they sent the facts with all the information or the database with all the information. And then there are the ones where they've gotten over the stigma. They recognize that that's happening all the time. It happens to everyone who has emails. It happened in half of the 480 cases that this client I mentioned had. You know, the, and, and in every one of those cases, the employees fessed up. And why did they fess up? Because there's no punishment for doing that. There's no punishment for an inadvertent uh, disclosure like that. That's something that a mature company recognizes happens all the time. I and that's to, how you get over it. And it's through I the preparation. I have to disagree with that. I have to disagree with that. A very common public relations response. And common. it may not, it, it's not the right one. But a very common response is someone's head is going to roll, and it's not to be the CEO. So if it's the head of IT, we'll get rid of him. And that will tell our customer base that, that we're on it and we care and we're responsive. And I don't think that that's necessarily the proper response. I think the marketplace has become much more sophisticated every day with it. recurring breaches. We're not disagreeing. Okay. Uh, two ends of the spectrum. Marissa, <laughs> so, I want to get you into the mix here. Um, you know, one of the things, shift the focus a little bit. He said, uh, he said to interrupt people. Yeah. 
So we want to talk about... Are we following the playbook? Yes. We're, we're way off the playbook. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about variability for a second. We often say, we, we've heard each other say these words, every breach is different. And I don't think for folks who haven't really been through it, and there are many folks who have been through it and then seen it at the, uh, the velocity and the volume that the folks on this panel have seen it, we see lots of volume. And what do we mean by every breach is different? What are we trying to say there? And what are the implications for a company? And how do you help guide them through this? Well, the, there are lots of things that make each breach different. I mean, John referenced one before. You've got a breach of credit card data versus a breach of SSI, and how you respond to that's completely different. Depending on the states that are involved, it will dictate a different response, whether you are triggering high tech. On the federal level, it will trigger a different response, and that's just the domestic. If you've got an international or foreign population, now you've got a lot of other regulatory landscapes to, to survey into the mix. Even organizations that have multiple breaches, no two are, are the same. I mean, quantity dictates different things. As I said, legal dictate, dictates different things. Circumstances, location of where the, the, absolutely, the, the recipients reside, all of these things, regardless if you've had companies at 489, all 489 are different in some way, shape, or form. It was a certain percentage of an employee population out of this one particular group versus employees all around the country or all around the world. I mean, it is, there, there are so many things that make them very different. Uh, there, there's, there are some things also that make them very similar. Uh, I mean, aside from the fact that you have to notify and call center and, and all those things, but uh, I was at a conference uh, yesterday in, in D.C. Um, and a figure came out that caught my attention. That's the fact that there's a 229-day delay between the time that a breach happens and the time that the company finds out about it. Now, to that, you now have to add however long it takes the company to notify the people affected. So it could be you know, days, weeks, months later. And this is probably going to send John spinning in a second here, but um, <laughs> basically, the one thing that's important for the victims at some point is to be given a retroactive view of everything that's happened as of the day that the event occurred. Not when they were notified, but all the way back when the event actually happened. And here's what John, please brace yourself. And, and this is why a credit report is very important, because a credit report can tell you everything that's affecting you as of the day. No, you're good. Okay, good. Um, you know, I think they are of the loss. So, although different breaches do require very different approaches to make sure that it is successful, there are certain tools, and, and there are many others, like a credit report that allows you a retroactive view of everything, so that then when you're notified, you can have a fraud person help you fix it. So, there are similarities, there are differences. You know, still holding it together. Wow, no effect. Just to, just to rise above the um, this, um, for a second, consider the view of the insurer, the, the excess insurer that writes a whole, you know, thousands and thousands, millions of policies, and, and from the perspective of that entity, um, all breaches are the same. You know, if you manage them the same way with the same Tiger teams or whatever, you'll come up with a good re result, right? But if you're the insured, if you're the customer, and these are your clients, then every breach requires a level of care and focus and creativity that, that, that where, where you have to bring the right resources to bear in that particular case. And so there are two different perspectives, two ends of the spectrum here. And very often um, what, what most restores customer trust, what most maintains customer relationships, what most um, protects your information is a, a completely different game plan than this team that you see up here. One of the things I'd like to expand on, I talked about quantity being um, a differentiator, and that's, I know that sounds very, very common, but it is one of the things that the larger the case, the more an organization needs to be dealing with certain call center issues. For example, you know, if you've got a breach of 500 or 5,000 or even 50,000, there are a certain percentage of calls within the first week, week and a half that the call center, despite all of the best efforts of FAQs that can't get answered, that then end up getting escalated back to the end client. Well, again, if you're dealing with 5,000, 50,000 uh, individuals and on average a 4 to 6% response, call response rate, and in our experience, it's anywhere between a 25 and 30% escalation rate the first week, week and a half, you can handle that. Now you take Target, you take Home Depot, you take some of these large healthcare breaches, and you take that call response percentage, which seems like a small percentage, then you take 30% of that, 
you've got organizations that are not prepared to handle 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 escalation calls a day. They're thinking that the privacy officer or the two people in the risk management office are going to be able to field all of these calls. So no two breaches are, uh, I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but one of the biggest things that makes them different is, is quantity of, of notices being mailed and potentially number of calls received. Well, that's a great segue into our next topic, which is the, uh, the biggest disruption we've seen in the last five years, the Krebs effect, which has driven straight to this problem, but many others. So I want to hear from each of you, you know, what we've seen happen. Since uh, Craig began, began doing what he's doing, um, other organizations, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, have all gotten into the same game. There are ways now to go find out what breaches have happened. And you do it by buying information on the black market. Um, and you look in your basket after you've made your purchase, and you go figure out where that came from. And then you call that organization and say, hey, I just bought some of your sensitive PII. Do you have any comment? Um, so a brand new cycle has really come about you know, in the past nine months. And it has turned everything that we do on its head. So, you know, Bill, I wanted to start with you, because you're right in the beginning of this. What happened? Nobody knows. The public finds out first, before the CEO, before the team, and now we have this incredible pressure to figure out, is this story true? Yeah, so we, we've done many cases like that. In fact, uh, I was on a call recently when Krebs broke the article and we were on the phone with the client. So it's like, okay, we just had Krebs, it's kind of, so now we do. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the attorneys that are involved are mission critical. They have the experience. Clients need to listen to them. Then from there, from the PR perspective, do you come out or do you not come out? So let, let's just show uh, hands in the audience. Krebs just broke your story. Who's coming out and admitting that we've got an issue with the company? Raise your hand. Come on, keep them high. It depends what kind of breach it is. No, 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 no. Well, let's see. Yeah, it's just okay. All right. So everyone else in the room is going to lay low, let the facts dictate themselves. You're going to take it in the press. It's day two. Krebs has broken another story about your client. Anybody? Deciding now to come on out? Yeah, I can't sit. sit so hold on. Yes. I'm, 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 I'm a PR person, darn it. Let me talk. Okay. <laughs> you are a PR person. That's right. So, PR, what do we do? This is you know, the Krebs effect. I, I love this. The first thing I do um, in the morning before I check my email is I check his website. Um, and, and that's a pretty phenomenal phenomenon. Um, wow. Uh, and, and if you're, as is what I just said. Um, you know, in the crisis communications world, we've had the Krebs around for a very long time. I mean, it's 60 minutes. That's the nature of 60 minutes. And, and with that came the rise of crisis communications. My, my opinion is you have to make a holding statement. Now this is where it gets very tricky and where a privacy council and the team, the response team, is critical. Um, as is maybe a gag and, you know, ties for the hands and mouth of your client. I think it's important to acknowledge that there's been an incident and I think that the nuance in the messaging is absolutely critical. You do not say how many, how many people have been affected because you just won't know. You won't know for months, you may not know for a year. Um, the very high profile PR mistakes that we've seen in the last year uh, could have been like any other breach incident, but the PR response was where the fault lies. And I think that if you don't say anything, he's corrupt is not gonna stop. And social media will pick it up. And then you're going to start to get the calls anyway. You want your client to have a thoughtful response. And this is not a response that you create in the 11th hour either. This is something you have, you have designed um, months in advance and rehearsed regularly. Um, but if you don't come out with a holding statement, it looks like you're hiding something. It looks like you are guilty of something. Um, and it just makes the reporters come after you harder. And then the story changes. And to your customers, or your, your clients' customers, 
looks like the cl your client's not in control. Let's talk um, so, so let's talk about those phone calls. Could I, He's really ahead, yeah. So I, I just wanted to, to uh, look at this a little differently. Um, you don't have to wait until Krebs comes out with something. You know Krebs is going to come out with something on any credit card breach. You know he's going to do it, right? So the question is, are you going to go before Krebs or after Krebs? And, 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 and after Krebs, yeah, you do the holding statement, etc. Before Krebs, there are all sorts of things you can do that Target didn't do and Home Depot didn't do and even Marcus and, and Michaels didn't do. But, but, I, but there are other people who do it. And, and, and what, they, what you can do is it depends on the type of breach. If it's a credit card breach, a primary account number credit card breach, then you can go out there. Just look at this scenario. You go out there and you say, we don't know what happened. We know because ID Analytics or someone told us, because they real, have really sensitive systems, the card brands told us that there's a problem, there could be a problem with your credit cards. We don't know. We're going to look into it thoroughly. We're going to hire him. But, when, but meanwhile, Check your statements, and if there's a problem, you call your banks and you get them to reissue your card. I can say that because there aren't many banks in this room, right? But the fact of the matter is that, that if you do that, then you've beaten Krebs, right? Then, and, and, and not only have you beaten Krebs, but you've let your client, your, your customers know that you are not Target. That you are, you are actually um, you know, reaching out to them faster than the other ones have because you care about them, and then you have prevented all the fraud recovery costs um, to the extent that you have gotten them to take action. Same thing with an email breach. What's the danger with an email breach? Phishing. So you can tell people about it voluntarily. J.P. Morgan waited a long time. Elevon didn't wait a long time before it told people. So, so the bottom line is there are ways that you can, you can get the information out in ways that have nothing to do with the breach notice laws but that protect the company, protect the brand. So, so one of the Krebs is just another uh, dimension that... Go ahead. Well, let's talk about what happens next. So once the word comes out, however it comes out, done poorly, done well, it's out, phone calls start. What do you do? You've had next to no time to prepare. Well, I mean, here's a, another sad statistic. Um, only about... Oh, sorry. Keep them coming. Sorry. It's okay to drink your next. I know. So, um, only about 34% of companies ever train their call centers on how to answer questions about a data breach. Now, it's not that people are not calling them, it's just they don't train them. Even if you hire someone like Larissa or someone like ourselves or Bro here, I mean, they just don't train them. So you have a lot of very confused employees who don't even know they had a breach who are now answering questions about an event they're unaware of, confusing everyone, making, you know, the, the, the new headlines, which is a PR problem. Uh, so, so really, what you need to do, which we're seeing, and I'll, we'll segue into the next uh, section a little bit here, is I'm seeing a lot of clients um, decide it is time to have a list of experts that are ready to call when time comes. Because the Krebs effect is going to be different a year from now. It will be a different Krebs. It will be something totally different that drives how you react. But the, the lasting advice for you guys is have a list of experts that you can call, including a call center that if something breaks, where you need lots of volume, you know, you, you got to handle lots of volume, you have it at a, you know, at a moment's notice. Because otherwise, you can be overwhelmed, and that in itself is going to be a PR nightmare about the fact that not only did you have a breach, you were unprepared, you know, people are waiting on hold for six hours, whatever it is, it, it just makes that recovery time a whole lot longer for you. What else has come out of the Krebs effect? Uh, a lot of it's operational for the company. How do we make sure that we continue processing information and people are going to trust us from a sales perspective. So how do we do that? Um, and a lot of clients, again, this kind of gets to what Melanie was talking about earlier about dress rehearsing your plan. It's also dress rehearsing your operations. So if your POS system is now impacted, how are you going to process cards going forward? Can the bank provide you a different alternative for you to process your cards? So you have to think about that, for example. How do we keep operations going? And that is a lot of panic from the CFO, CEO, especially when they see it on Krebs, and they're like, how is that going to impact sales? But how do we make sure that operations continue to keep flowing? So Krebs is adding fuel to that. And unfortunately, when people get in a box, they come out with irrational thoughts on how we're going to do things. If they would just stick to the plan, things would go a lot better. Well, I, I, but I with Krebs, uh, like last point, I'm sorry. 
that's okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. We're all sorry. Can we just sorry. Keep <laughs> <laughs> we, it's, we, we it's stipulate it, the sorrow. <laughs> it, it does, doesn't it? Um, it just gets to the point of you rehearse, you go out, you continue to keep following the plan, and you re-emphasize the plan. Again, it's a dress rehearsal. I've worked for one client. They, they experienced about 2,000 plus data incidents a year. Those are incidents. Now remember, everything's an incident before it comes a breach, but these guys have about 2,000 incidents a year. They have an incident response plan. They go through it on a monthly basis, and they refine it, retune it, bring in everyone that's on the plan for the PR firm, to the outside forensics, to the C-suite, and they walk through new threats that are out in the marketplace. And that's the key, because it's changing all the time. Let me just give you an example. Sounds like uh, a smart client. <laughs> All clients are smart. Um, the, the, the thing is, malware is being created, a new strain of malware is being created about uh, every second that's out there. Uh, again, go back to the offense preference on this. You can't defend it. Let me say that again. You cannot defend what they are creating out there. You can only stop once you figure out what it is. But this particular client, they brought in two different vendors. They said, your system's clean. We were brought in next. We ran through it. We identified a new strain of malware, something I've never seen before. This thing was actually pretty cool when you de deconstructed it on what it was doing and how it evaded all these detections that were out there. This company spent a lot of money on the technology for it. But the thing is, if you do what I call defense by layers, then you can start picking stuff up, and then you can neutralize the Krebs effect on how many people potentially might be impacted. And I think that's what you have to start reversing and thinking about defense by layers because they're going to get inside the house. Do you guys think that there's uh, a Krebs effect for small breaches as well? Because, I mean, and listen to your example here, and we, we were working on a breach not long ago where it was a smaller company, the CEO got a phone call from Microsoft uh, saying that they were seeing some unusual traffic in their servers and that they thought, it, it felt like they were under attack. Uh, and to confirm the information, they wanted to make sure that the password to, to I guess, the administrative rights had not been compromised. And the, the caller asked the CEO, you know, what is the password? And he said, you know, whatever. So yeah, that's exactly what we have. Good. Let me do a little work and make sure that everything is okay. Well, obviously the caller was really the, the social engineer, and they stole out of this small company about 100,000 records. And here you have a CEO who's freaking out, going, "What the heck happened?" Now that will never make it into the Krebs log. So I'm, I'm really curious. And this is really for the panel. Is there because Krebs only goes after the, after the very, very big fish? What about the other 99 percent of the breaches? I'm curious what happens with that. You know, he's been going after some small players as well, uh, but a lot of stuff that he's trying to publish out there um, is around POS, but also around other known vulnerabilities that have major impact that can impact the smaller players as well. I think there's, I think there's a great marketing opportunity, Ozzy, for you to be to be Krebs for the smaller guys and start publishing that. <laughs> well, let's talk a bit about where we want to go. So a, a lot of our lives are uh, pretty chaotic, pretty reactive. Um, and you've heard some of the stories that, that you get into. You get the sense that timelines are collapsing. You get the sense that people are panicked. We're dealing with executives who are used to being masters of their universe. And suddenly they find themselves in this, this crazy spot. And you've heard little inklings of where we'd like to be. So we all, we all share a dream that we would have, we would have smart clients. Um, most importantly, we would have prepared clients that they have thought about this. They have worked through each of these uh, disciplines. Um, gotten some counsel. Um, so, you know, a lot of work about preparation. Are we there? Are companies ready? This is for you, Ozzy. Sure. Are companies ready to really engage on preparation? Uh, they're more ready now than they have been in the past. Obviously, Krebs and some of the large retailer regions have uh, brought the issue to the forefront. But we have a lot of work to do. I mean, right now, only about 73% of companies have a response plan in place. And I should be impressed by all these numbers that I've been throwing at you. How many have read it? Um, 
100%. So sadly, and the more sad stuff, 78% uh, of the companies that have a data breach response plan um, tell you that it will not be effective because the plan has never been read, the plan has never been practiced since it was written, whenever it was written. So they check the box, but they all know full well if, there, if anything ever goes down, throw this thing away because it's got old phone numbers, old names, scenarios that have nothing to do with what's happening today. But, but again, they, there are some signs of hope. For example, you know, the number 54% of companies, I, I get one too, 54% uh, of companies are now conducting training, trying to help employees become much more sensitive to their proper way to work with and secure uh, uh, personal information. So we're making big strides, and, and we're seeing that in, I want to say, in a way, the number of breaches of the system is getting to be more. I think the number of records, in some ways, are getting smaller. And even if records do get compromised, the kinds of data, going to John's point, it's not, it doesn't rise to the, it doesn't go from incident to data breach. And that could, that could be, you know, very beneficial for companies. So it's getting better, but there's a long way to go. How much impact are boards having on this conversation? Huge, huge recently. I mean, it, you've got the SEC um, now on this issue, and and it's it's going up. If you if you look at the top issues for general counsel, which tend to be the top issues for boards, privacy is up at the top of the regulatory issues. Above all, there are other industry specific issues, and and the regulatory aspects aren't the key aspects to them. It's the unknown risks and the breaches that they're worried about, and the and the, and the customer. Uh, uh, breach issues. So, so uh, it, it's really huge right now. Um, one thing I was thinking of uh, this morning, one of the early panels was talking about there's no teeth in the third party uh, coverage. Um, you can do as badly as you want to in the first party, make mistakes, whatnot, um, and you still get the third party coverage. So I'm guessing that there's some thought, some thinking about uh, that changing. And we've certainly seen that if you do a good job on the uh, initial response, you can really cut these uh, future costs down uh, dramatically. So. You know, will there become some kind of an economic divide between companies that are prepared and companies that are not prepared in terms of you know, who, who we would want to work for, um, what the insurance companies might pay, um, what are the economic impacts of, of not being prepared as we go into this future? Well, I think one of the obvious ones is that if you're not prepared and you've not vetted any vendor as part of the process, any one of us or, or others that are involved, you're obviously going to be paying if you're calling it you know, Friday at 5.30, which is when normally most of these things happen, um, you're going to be paying the rates of, you know, that they're working all weekend and, you know, whereas if you were, if you were more prepared, you had a policy, you vetted the vendors, even though the insurance company has vendors on their panel, you might have a, a, a vendor in any one of our capacities that you might work with better than, than somebody else. So vetting that vendor process, not only is that going to help from a, a cost perspective, it's going to help from a relationship perspective. And I think the most important reason why you would do that is you want to work with people that are experienced in working together. You know, the last thing you want to do, you're going through this for the very first time as a, as a client. The last thing you want to do is have four or five people that are part of your response team that have never worked together. They don't know how to communicate. They don't know what to communicate, who's doing what. That quarterback, that, that privacy attorney we talked about, a breach coach, is such a central figure, but so are all the other members of the breach response team. And so the experience of, of that particular team working together, I think, I think certainly will help cut the cost both on the carrier level as well as for the can I, oh. can I talk about prepared in, in, in a minute? Go ahead, if you want. I, 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 just <laughs> I think she does. <laughs> if you must. I think she does. Okay. I, I would like you to, must. actually. Um, I'm just going to take it a step further from it, one of the things that we haven't talked about, and I'm going to point it now, I'm going to steal you know, Bo's charm, is you talk about the Krebs effect. Well, what about the target effect? What happens when you don't handle a breach incident properly, or a, a privacy violation for that matter? We always talk about breaches, but we should also just talk about privacy in the same vein. Um, ultimately, you could have brand devastation. I go so far as to say, what's happened at Target will be cemented to that brand for a generation. Uh, for those of us that are over the age of you know, 40, we remember the Tylenol poisonings in the 80s, a horrific incident. Um, and for decades, when people thought of Tylenol, they thought about these poisonings. And that's nothing you could ever have seen coming. 
the effect on the brand when you have any kind of a crisis can, can continue for generations, if not handled properly. So two points I want to make. One is, you cannot market your way out of a crisis. If you don't handle it properly, you're going to live with that damage to your brand for a very long time. And you know, in the, this, the case of Target, we've lost the C-suite, um, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to be paid out. And not, I would say most consumers who, who were shoppers at Target, loyal shoppers, probably do think twice before they walk in or they use their credit card uh, on Target.com. I'm not saying they don't, you know, they're, just, they're not customers, but there's been quite a amount of damage. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing I think that we need to consider as a value add is brand rehabilitation. After an incident has happened, we shouldn't run out the door to catch a flight back home and say, you know, good luck. They need help recovering their brand, and there are all sorts of things that can be done uh, through public relations, traditional public relations tools, corporate social responsibility, community boards, community engagement, uh, editorial board visits, op-eds, going out and meeting with the press, and telling them in a very forthright, but again, thoughtful manner what you've done to remediate the damage, what you're going to do differently, and show a commitment to your customers. And you know, I think for a lot of people in our industry, particularly in, in crisis communications, there is an emphasis with get in, do the crisis work, get out. And I think that we owe a lot more to our customers. We need to help them well beyond the crisis to help them fully recover and get back to where they want to be. So, so I, I want to paint a picture of the other side of, uh, of the, the, the world um, uh, because we've been talking, I've been trying to, to, to give you an image of how this works when companies are good at it. And, and when, when companies are good at it, preparedness is not practicing and practicing and, and going through the drill time and time again. You heard a little bit of, of this from Bill. You know how security has changed in the old days? We security lawyers used to say, well, you need consistency of application of your security program. Everybody who knows security knows that's not where it's at now. Where it's at is adaptiveness. Where it's at is not consistent application. Where it's at is being able to, to, to deal with the Krebs effect and everything else. So your smart client, when you were talking about it, was saying they're going through their plan and they're, and they're kicking the tires of it. They're not just repeating it. So the, so the bottom line is um, preparedness is preparation to be able to act flexibly and adaptively. And that's the hardest thing. Nobody's there, but there's a huge divide as you're hearing on this panel and as you heard all day. I just wanted to make sure that you understood how wide the divide is. So, Bo, to answer your uh, economic impact on the client side of the house. Uh, so, I, I do a lot of interim management. Sometimes I'll step into interim CFO role. The, the effect's huge, especially when you have a breach. What's, do I have proper risk mitigation in place? Is this going to be an economic impact to my EBITDA for next quarter? You know, if I'm a public company, how is that going to impact shareholder value? from a branding perspective, exactly what Melanie's talking about. It's going to stay with them for quite some time. A technology investment is now going to happen. How much is that going to run? Where are the funds going to come through through that? And for some companies, unfortunately, if they have a breach, they close the doors if they don't have the proper type of insurance. Or, you know, Because it's an unplanned risk event, and these things are expensive. It, it takes a lot of funds to kind of go through and figure out from a forensics, attorneys, the mailings, the PR, everything encapsulated, it's, it's getting very expensive. And it's, it's going to continue to keep going that way. And you just have to think about it from the client side. Unplanned risk, economic impact, what's going to happen moving forward? And I, and I think from a CFO's perspective, they're really starting to understand this, taking various different examples that we're talking about. But I mean, Ozzy brought up a very good point. For small companies that are out there that have to go through this, $50,000 to them, that is either going to put them in the red or the black for the year. And having that type of economic impact for one event, and then what's the daisy chain that happens with that going forward? 
And that's the kind of thing that I think a lot of clients need to start understanding, especially from an insurance perspective. I mean, I, I ex expect cyber insurance to be like general liability. I think every company will probably have it uh, within the next five years. Well, I had one last question for the panel, but I wanted to stop. We've got just a couple of minutes and see if any of you have a question for one of the panelists. Anyone? No questions? All right. They want to go? They, they're thirsty. I'm <laughs> scared. Take a couple more minutes. Go ahead. Well, I'll ask this last question. We'll start uh, with you, Melanie. You know, on this preparation topic, uh, all the things that you've seen, if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and you could have your clients do one thing differently, one thing well, with relation to your particular expertise in these events, what would it be? Slow down and listen to the experts. Um, and I, I guess the onus is on people in my field to earn the trust of these companies that we do know what we're doing. We have their best interests at heart. Um, and I guess the onus is also on us to inform them of the dangers inherent in the world today and what we as, as experts can do to help them through the process, which seems to now be an inevitable process. But I could go on, but that, that would be my one thing. Yeah, 15 seconds. John? I would uh, get them away from the experts if I had a wish. And, 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 and I would get them away from the experts by, 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 by helping them to, teaching them to fish. Um, and that's what, that's, what, that's what people are doing. And, you know, and, and uh, so, you, you know, 10 years from now, you won't be seeing breach coaches in the same way. Because, and you won't be seeing teams like this in the same way. It will have been incorporated into what companies do. I'm probably more where Melanie is, get the right people involved first. And that would be my favorite bridge coach. Bill. Oh, I'll just get them all. Except the others here. You're now with John. <laughs> we're going every other. Yeah, every other. Is that what we rehearsed in the plan? That's every, right. That's every right. Yes. There we go. We never tested it. That's, that's right. right. We never tested it. <laughs> um, from, a, from a client's perspective, just from preparedness, Who's on first? Kind of the old analogy. What's on second? As long as they understand the moving parts, uh, the better off you're going to be. Ozzy, final words. I think you're with. So I would say data, but I would say something a little different, which is if your client has had a data breach, something I said at a, at a previous panel, their response is going to be criticized, period, for many, many reasons. So it's important for them to give the critics as few talking points as possible and to be, and to be ready with answers for whatever people do criticize. So just general advice. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate your input. I learn something every time we do this. <laughs>